Okay, so welcome everyone to the next instalment in our series of um, discussions called UMAC Origins. Uh, UMAC Origins is something that uh, UMAC, the International Committee for uh, University Museums, the International Committee of ICOM, has, um, has started up to uh, reflect on the fact that our international group has been around now for some 20 years. And uh, so far, those of you who have been watching the series would have seen some um, some interesting people we've been talking to. And we have a, another very interesting person with us to um, to speak with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce you shortly to Peter Tyrrell, who is joining us from um, Oklahoma, uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Um, Peter uh, was the Associate Director of the Sam Noble Museum of, of Natural History at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, also an adjunct professor at the uh, College of Liberal Studies there. And is also, of course, very well remembered for being the 2011 recipient of the Hugo H. Rodek Award for Excellence for Contributions to the museum field that's awarded by the Mountain Plains Museum Association. Now, Peter has um, has racked up 36 years of service to the um, museum at the university there. Um, but we're really speaking to him because he was a very active member, particularly during the first 10 years, the first half of UMAX history. He uh, served uh, for a long time on the um, as a UMAC board member and uh, and led some of the, the working groups also, I believe. Um, Peter, welcome. How are things in the United States? Well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you uh, interview me. Uh, things in the United States are, uh, I guess one would say topsy-turvy. Uh, if everyone understands what I'm saying, they're a bit, <laughs> another one might be up in the air or sort of um, going on that uh, we're looking forward to a calmer future, I guess. But, yes, I, I think uh, everyone I've spoken to from the United States says exactly that. They're hoping for a calmer future. So uh, not, just, yep. not just for the United States, but for everyone, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right, too. Okay, Peter, why don't we start? Could you possibly um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background and, and how you ended up working with, with university, university museums and why you kind of got interested in university museums? All right. Um, well, I feel a bit like I should be in a wheelchair or something or, you know, sort of a <laughs> When you mentioned the word origins for UMAC, I thought, well, it, maybe it's paleo history here uh, <laughs> to interview some of us. But I am uh, not very active in the field at the moment, although I try to remain uh, active on everything else. But I'm very interested in what's going on with UMAC, and then I try to, I do try to keep up with the field. As far as myself goes. Um, at an early age, and we'll start back in the paleo days, I guess, um, I was influenced by a museum that was local, uh, more or less a, a natural history, although it had uh, art exhibits as well. And um, I went there on uh, Saturday mornings, and they had programs for children. And uh, I think that's an important point. And um, lots of kids were there, I would say probably, you know, 100 or 150 or so, and they had speakers come in about different subjects, mainly in natural history. I think the program was called Nature Hour. And um, most of my experience has been in natural history. Uh, and so I guess uh, that early influence uh, pervaded or extended all the way through. And I'm still much of an old time naturalist, I guess, at heart. So I think a point to be made, not just about me, but maybe anyone, is that having a local museum that you can go to um, can be very important in the direction of your life. 
and my parents encouraged it. And uh, uh, around the house, I had, shall we say, critters that I brought in from the wild at times. Uh, I used to raise butterflies and moths and feeding baby birds and um, traipsing off into the woods. I was fortunate enough to live on the edge of town so I could do those sorts of things. And I think that access for that kind of activity, if at all possible, even if you're in the city, get to the park or something like that with your kids. So I think having an early uh, influence like that I got very interested in birds, and um, uh, that's maintained all the way through my life. Um, I got degrees associated with ornithology, and um, I still go bird watching, and I'm an experienced falconer at this point, and still have probably my last bird at this point. So. Uh, that's the early stage, I would say. I was fortunate enough to go to a local nature camp um, that was run by the Massachusetts Audubon Society um, and uh, got a lot of early training about natural history there. I later on volunteered there and then I worked there as a student and uh, it was very exciting and I got to do a lot of things um, such as uh, one time uh, there was a blind, a hide, some people call it, on a red-tailed hawk's nest, and we climbed up to the uh, a, a tree near the nest, and I was spent a whole afternoon there photographing the parents bringing food into the nest and feeding the young, and I got just so engrossed, I forgot what time it was, and um, the director of the program also forgot about me. <laughs> so I was up there for something like six hours. Uh -huh. I thought it had only been minutes. And finally he said, we forgot about you. And uh, I had a chance to do early photography and I'll see all these marvelous things, which then led to, a, you know, degrees in ornithology and, and so forth and so on. But the whole thing, again, was even though it was mainly in the outdoors, there were collections at this little yeah. uh, trailside museum and collections at the museum that we could use to study. So the whole business of museums uh, with natural history and, and uh, sort of what you might call, you know, amateur research and this sort of stuff was uh, important to me. So uh, it's a long time thing. And uh, when I went to graduate school, I thought I'd be an environmental uh, educator. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I did that for quite a while. And then I um, worked at that. This was in the late 60s where the environmental movement was very strong in the United States. And thank goodness it was. Or, you know, I know some things are troubling today about greenhouse gases and climate change and I wonder sometimes I feel like a failure I think what happened we worked so hard to gain some things back in those times yet we can also say well what if we didn't do that mm. uh, might we be a whole lot worse off these days yep so uh, went back to academia at the University of Oklahoma to actually finish out a PhD uh, but had the opportunity to get involved in a tremendous growth program for the Natural History Museum at the University of Oklahoma. That took up the rest of my career, basically, with outgrowths into professional organizations and then mm -hmm. building a, a big, brand new Natural History Museum, which at the time uh, was a very unusual thing here in the United States. No one had... Uh, built any new university natural history museums for 50 years. Yeah. At least. And so a lot of them were in very uh, poor state, uh, not well thought of necessarily, uh, except, you know, the research components uh, generally. Uh, many of the collections were in disrepair across the United States. And um, so it was quite unusual um, and a big deal. And Oklahoma has not ever been known as a highly cultured museum oriented state. And um, so this was unusual and, and, uh, and very successful and 
I sort of began preaching uh, to others, and I hate to use that word, but in, in the beginning I did, although I found out I shouldn't do that really. But uh, that if it could be done in Oklahoma, it maybe could be done many places where yep. Um, yep. our buildings could burn down and collections were being eaten by uh, insects and in rodents in some cases and university officials and uh, administrators were turned a blind eye and said, well, why don't you just get rid of these things and we won't have to worry about them anymore. Yeah, so there was there was a real a real sense at that time in the 1990s that a lot of the collections in higher education were under threat of uh, complete deterioration or losing all the information associated with them and things like that. Is that fair to yes, say? Yes, that's exactly right. And so that's more or less the beginning of, or the story of the, the early story of before UMAC anyway, in, in my own uh, yep. personal. And uh, during the time that I helped build that museum, uh, and we could go into some details about what I did if you want to, uh, but I was also very active in museum organizations around the U.S. at that time. Yep. Yeah, um, I think it's 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 very interesting because what you're talking about the um, you know raising the money for the Sam Noble uh, Museum of Natural History at the University of Oklahoma is a uh, a kind of a bit of an outstanding thing as you, you know you're quite right that um, no one was going to build uh, a new natural history museum from scratch at a university uh, unless you could get the uh, the money for it outside which you guys managed to do um, and it, it's interesting when you compare that situation with today where you have philanthropists who'll stump up to support art museums on campus but I don't see it. I think it's a bit unusual to get philanthropists supporting natural history museums. Um, and that, that's why I think, you know, what you guys achieved in Oklahoma was quite a standout, a standout case. Do you, do you think that's, that's right? Do you think it's always harder to uh, raise money for natural history museums than it is for art museums? Or is that too much of a generalization, do you think? Well, I think it's a generalization in the United States. Um, and now that I've uh, been to a number of other countries, um, I think that's generally true, although I would let others speak to that. Uh, perhaps, yep. you know, like persons such as yourself and, and other colleagues that uh, maybe are listening into this conversation. But in the United States, that's generally true. And I don't want to seem uh, biased or unfair because uh, many of my best thoughts and ideas have come from my colleagues in art museums of and course. visiting art museums and so forth. But that was generally true in that um, the philanthropy and uh, persons who had money to provide as gifting and, and gifting itself is a strong cultural practice in the U.S. Yep. Um, that was something that in my naivete, some, when I began to talk with people at UMAC, that I realized that uh, things were different in other countries. And I expected mm -hmm. them to be, but uh, that was one of the things that struck home. Yep. So, yes, uh, if one went to the university's campus, and they had a museum, it was more likely to be an art museum. Yeah. And uh, people understood that because it was very common for people with money, let's say, uh, to purchase art. This was yep. the thing that if I think it's fair to say that rich people did. Yep. Now some rich people or people of means or however you want to say also went out and uh, similarly in some ways, uh, collected natural history. If mm -hmm. you think of some of the big giant collections in yep. the British museums, for instance, uh, people went out to other countries, particularly you know, Africa, New Guinea, yeah. and these places, and collected birds of paradise, the Rothschilds, for instance. Yep. And so, um, 
and if you go in the US, this was also true uh, to some extent. But by and large, absolutely what you were saying is if you went to the universities at that time, um, the natural history museums were in real trouble. Yeah. They were not being supported well. And people said, why do we need, you know, 50,000 birds stuffed yeah. in a drawer, which no one sees and they're dusty and da 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 da. And, but we've got these paintings that we can show that are colorful and they're rare and so-and-so has spent a lot of money to show them. But I would emphasize too that in my, it's my own experience that in many cases, um, the art museums were also on somewhat of a starvation diet. Mm -hmm. um, the buildings were better, the collections were better looking in many cases, but the yep. staffing and the upkeep uh, often was kind of tough. Yeah. And uh, over time, uh, as Andrew, as you know, one of the things that I became very interested in was strategic planning. Yep. And, um, and in strategic planning, one looks for as many different ways as you can partner and coalesce and work yes. different angles and so forth. And so teaming with the art museum, rather than seeing yourself as- As a being a competing with, yeah. Convincing them that we would work together on these things yep. was often very successful in some ways. And I, th I and think- um, to, yeah. yeah. I'm well, sorry, I was just, I was just going to say that I think that um, what you're saying is quite, quite true. And now yeah. I think we're even seeing a trend, uh, particularly on university campuses, for more interdisciplinary type of museum experiences for people. Uh, you know, there are some examples where people are starting to bring the science and the arts together as a, as a way of um, engaging the public and as a way of engaging their own students and own staff for that matter as well. Yeah, and there's something that occurs to me also in thinking about this. Um, I believe you asked me to have a little bit of discussion about the organization of museums in the U.S. Yeah. Professional type organization. Yeah. The, the reason and, why, why I was asking that, Peter, was it's, it's very interesting. When we've spoken to... Um, other people who became active in UMAC during the early days, just about all of them, and I had the same experience, were originally hooked up with some either regional or national network. And, and then when UMAC was formed and we all started to compare notes, sure, we could see some of the differences, but we could also see a lot of similarities. So, yeah, yeah what, what was your experience in the States uh, around the, the late 90s in terms of regional networks and national networks? Right. Well, and I'm going to circle back uh, eventually to this comment of working with art museums and yep. so forth. If, if my memory doesn't fail, me to do it. <laughs> um, the the U.S. Uh, United States has many museum organizations, and they're somewhat hierarchical. Hierarchical, uh, if I can say that. Um, there are 50 states. Yep. And nearly every state has a museum organization that's about its state museums. Okay. And then there are, there is uh, six regions in the United States, um, and they're called the regional museums. Now, the state museums don't report to the regional groups or anything like that. Right. Um, we do work together, but the fact is <clears throat> they operate independently. And then... I don't want to say over the regions, but then there's the, a national organization, the American Association, uh, yep. American Alliance of Museums now, it changed its name. Mm -hmm. And that's the overall group in the United States, but they do not govern the regions and they do not govern the states. It's, they're basically all independently, independently operating, but they do work together and have cooperative programs. Yep. So I was a member of my state and did things in the state. Um, I quickly joined the region. Um, I guess I thought I was too big for the state or something. <laughs> no, really, I just met people and uh, they were going to the region, said, you should come here. It's where you can meet more people and it's more exciting. And uh, so I joined what was called the Mountain Plains Museum Association. Yep. 
and that's primarily down through the middle of the United States. That's one of your six regions, yep. Yes, one of the six between Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Mm -hmm. So from Canada to Mexico and between the Rockies and the Mississippi, everything in between. Yep. And uh, it's a huge area, as you might guess. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's 1,500 to 1,700 or something uh, miles between one border to the next. Yep. You know? yep. so it's, a, it's the biggest region. It's sprawled out. It's the most rural region. And um, it's where the cowboys and, and frankly, um, Native Americans are typically and um, you rural type, lots of big agriculture and so forth and so mm -hmm. on. And coming from New England, where I grew up, uh, uh, I felt right at home. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but good. I think primarily because I had gone to graduate school in North Dakota, and North Dakota is one of the states in this in this region. Okay. So, and uh, it wasn't uh, but um, a couple of years that I, uh, was encouraged to become active at the national level. And of course, at this time, uh, the Noble Museum, which was went by a different, different name at that time, uh, we were planning and fundraising and so forth, and it really required knowing uh, more about what was going on at the national yeah. level. And yep. being aware of, you know, and we were looking for national architects. and. Fundraising, even though we were the University of Oklahoma, of course we had uh, uh, alumni all over. We had students coming in. We had foreign students, many foreign students. Yep. We had professors coming in. Uh, our administration, our professors weren't necessarily homegrown and this sort of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, knowing what was going on at the national um, level and the regional level and so forth was, was very important to the museum's growth as well as my own personal growth. And then certainly I would encourage anybody listening, but if you're listening, you probably know this, that the best way you can grow your institution and yourself is to become very active in these organizations yep. as much as your budget and your institution will allow and participate because that's really where you start to make your your connections with your colleagues and you start to learn and they can critique what you're saying and you can critique them and you you learn so much so that's, that's one thing i'd really like to say and here's the point i want to circle back to if you don't mind sure uh, at that time when as we were talking about the the state of university museums. The national organization, the American, at that time, the American Association of Museums, which yep. became the American Alliance of Museums, was the only organization that was uh, had accreditation of museums. Okay. Not the state, not the regions, but the national organization. And I got, was involved with that, uh, primarily because uh, despite its somewhat destitute situation, uh, I was lucky and the people at the uh, Noble Museum, which was then called the, first called the Stovall Museum, yep. thought that accreditation was very important. They also thought that operating at the state, regional and national level was very important. So, and we were accredited. Um, how I don't know exactly, <laughs> but I do know because I read the reports and we said, oh my goodness, how did we manage to get through this because of accreditation? Fantastic. You do have to meet certain practices and principles yeah. and care and so forth. Well, uh, and we were up for renewal and we had bur buildings that would burn down and as I said, insects and uh, leaky doors and roofs and things. So I was put in charge of helping to get ready for all of this review. And um, boy, uh, we had some work to do. But at the time, AAM, lots of people in AAM didn't really know anything about university museums. Yeah. Maybe that's why we got passed. Yep. And so 
you know, and they say, well, um, why are you people crying for money? You know, <laughs> don't, you're at a university museum. Don't you have a lot of money? Yeah, you're in a university. Surely you must be wealthy. Yep. Exactly. And the sound answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no the, the university museums were in tough shape and the, uh, they didn't understand the governance. Yep. Uh, you know, it's a little different in Australia and other countries, I'm sure, but we all know that we have to report to a chancellor or a president or a, some board or some top. Well, um, private museums report, the director reports to a board. Yep. Well, at university museums, you report to the president and or, you know, a, a top guy and uh, what they say goes. You yep. don't have a board, or if you have a board, they don't have power generally. they usually just an advisory capacity if you've got a board in the university museum, yeah. Yeah, and so they didn't understand the government uh, governance. They didn't understand why we needed money. Um, and when you're looking at numbers of specimens, why do you have so many specimens when the private museums, even though they might have many, by comparison, they have very few. Yep. In many private museums or the big public ones, uh, not at universities, most of the things are on display. Whereas at a university museum, most <laughs> of the things are not on display. Yep, that's, that's right. They're founded on research collections. Yep. And those numbers are important because numbers of specimens are how you make decisions. You don't yes. look at just one and say, oh, well, all of these birds are red. Now, yeah. wait a minute. <laughs> then we find the females are gray and the juveniles have spotted breasts that aren't all red. So gathering a sample is in science of what you have is very, very important. Now, yep. it would be just like going to an art museum and saying, well, I know Van Gogh when I see it. But if, unless you've seen a number of Van Goghs, you might get fooled. <laughs> so the numbers game can work in the art museum as well. But it didn't work for AAM because they really didn't understand why yeah. we were on research levels where private museums don't carry on research that way. Yep. And the university museums, in fact, weren't necessarily carrying on big exhibits and education the way that the public ones were doing. Like the one that I went to when I was a kid. Yep. It had lots of education programs. So the university museums had less of the education going on and much more of the research. Mm -hmm. And here's another big thing, as you well know, many of the collections are spread out all over the campuses. <laughs> they're here, they're there, they're everywhere. Yep. And sometimes they're in good shape and sometimes they're in an old barn or something. <laughs> And uh, it's went, just like Australia, Peter. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I tell terrible, I, sh I ne will not tell who it was, but on the accreditation process, I got involved in the accreditation process. And so I have been to nearly every university natural history museum and many, many natural history, many, many museums in the United States. And probably 25 I've done on the accreditation process. So, okay. yep. so I did a lot of this sort of thing and l learned a lot, but my goodness, in some cases, um, viewing the collections was horrific. Um, I remember going into under a football stadium where the museum had uh, its history collections and they had not only natural history, but history. They said, where are we going to store these things? And so they had all these history pieces, furniture, this and that, hundreds of, maybe thousands of things with, with plastic sheeting over them because they were under the football <laughs> stadium and bats were flying in and out, urinating all over the sheets. So this is the conditions that some of the university yeah. museums were in. Um, I remember going to another one, um, and uh, oh my goodness, I was talking to one of the exhibit people. We were down in the exhibit shop, 
and it was in the basement and they had the windows open and I was pointing, sort of taking notes and talking to them because I said, well, how often are the windows open? Because, you know, bugs and this and that. Stuff can get in, yep. A duck flew into the window and came in. <laughs> a duck. <laughs> so, Fantastic. And it wasn't on staff either, I presume yes. you're telling me. No, and, um, you know, anyway, I won't tell you the fate of that particular museum <laughs> in the accreditation process, but anyway, <laughs> it was a struggle. So yeah. these were some of the conditions that were present in the U.S. Yep. And not well understood necessarily by AAM. Now, that's quite different now, and, uh, um, and I could go into some depth how that came about, but it changed thanks to a lot of university museums standing up and saying, look, uh, these are the things. And so the accreditation process actually got modified. Yeah. And uh, they actually developed a separate um, sort of review process, um, a granting process that, that looked at governance specifically mm -hmm. uh, and it changed. So that was very helpful. Now, I'm not going to talk forever. I know you think I might, but in, when I got to, I couldn't wait to see, you know, other museums in other countries to see, wait a yeah. minute. I know they have all these wonderful pieces. I know they've been collecting for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years where we've been only collecting for 150 years or something. What's it like in Europe? What's <laughs> it like in Australia? You know, what's it like in Korea? Um, and so, you know, this is the kind of background that, that yeah. came in. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. It's, it's, it's really interesting because the story you tell there about the lack of awareness um, because of the different governance arrangements in the, in, the, in the big sort of professional museum associations, it's exactly the same story as Australia, which is why um, Cormac was formed as a, originally as an independent organisation. Uh, and again, now we'd say that that has changed. We have come some distance and now we're kind of like a network within the, the bigger professional association. Um, but now I guess that there was actually a forerunner to AAMG, wasn't there? And, and were you involved with that? Um, yes, there was. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful how we have all these acronyms for these yes. organizations. <laughs> Most of them unpronounceable, I might <laughs> um, the forerunner to AAMG, um, the Academic Association of Museums and Galleries, if I have got that correct, and I better get it right. That sounds I, spot on. Yeah, and if I haven't, please, anyone listening, let me know. <laughs> uh, was called UMAC. Or no, wait, I'm sorry, we're UMAC. It was my... my <laughs> I'm getting confused already. There are many called, acronyms, yes. It was called ACUM, and we thought that ACUM. was wonderful because it was universe like ACUMEN or something. <laughs> um, it was ACUMG, which stood for the Association of College and University Museums and okay. Galleries. Okay, yep, yep. Wait, the Association of College and University Collections, yeah, and Galleries. Yeah, something anyway, like that, that anyway, was, yep. Like that. And I should remember because I was president for six years. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. No problem. So, uh, yeah. And that's another thing I might add about the uh, organization of museums in the United States is that not only is there the AAM and then the regions and then the states, but floating through all of this, uh, in a mayu, shall we call it, I guess, if that's the pronoun pronunciation, yep. um, are separate organizations, again, um, of exhibitors, yes, of educators, yes. yep. of collection people, of uh, different groups. Yeah, registrars, conservators, yeah. Exactly. So people in a, uh, ACUM, or AAMG as it is, uh, not only belong to that, but they probably belong to their region and they probably belong to their state and they probably belong to AAM or AMI uh, if they, and, and so, uh, and AAM has its own 
uh, actually AAM is the is the sort of parent for all of these other yeah. Uh, organizations and there's a bunch of them I mean it's not just three or four there's like 20 25 there's a management group for instance that I was active in and I was active in the exhibitors group and I was active in the traveling exhibitors group uh -huh. and the education I spent a good deal of years in the education uh, uh, committee of AAM so um, it's it's it, it could be viewed as daunting and confusing or terribly exciting, you know. To, 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 to always do. Yep. It, and, it um, sounds as complicated as your uh, electoral system, but we won't go there. We'll sort of no, please. avoid that Avoid that for the time. But, okay, yeah. what, was the, uh, what was the earliest um, UMAC or UMAC associated meeting that, that you went to, Peter? Well, um, I guess... I went to Scotland. Ah, uh, that's the Glasgow. death of <laughs> museums meeting. The University of Museums in Scotland. Yep, Umis? yep, Umis, yep. Umis. And it was sort of, I saw some notice in uh, an AAM bulletin or something, and Umis uh, meeting in Scotland, and I saw, you know, and it said, uh, university museums discussion or something. And I thought, well, that might be interesting. <laughs> Why not? So yep. I contacted uh, some folks over there and said, um, if you can give me a free pass and I'll come and present and like All to right. be there. Yep. And so they did. And, uh, I went there and then I found out uh, that Peter Stanberry and some others uh, were at that meeting and that they were trying to form a committee in yeah. ICOM. And I didn't know very much about ICOM. I knew what it was, but I didn't, I mean, not roughly. And uh, I didn't know that there wasn't a university uh, group in, in ICOM. I knew there were some other committees. Um, so then uh, I had also signed up to go to Paris to sort of the follow-up. Yes, that's right. Of, there was this other meeting. This was all before the inauguration of, of yes. UMAC because the argument still had to be won with the ICOM um, uh, board and the executive. Yes. So there was, yeah, there was a meeting in Scotland, then very soon after a meeting in Paris. Just a week later, a week in Paris uh, held at the Finnish... Uh, console or something, I believe, in the yeah. building. And I had a terrible time finding it. And um, <laughs> nothing against the Finns. I, I, I mean, I was a novice here. I had never been to France or anything. Yep. So not Paris. And uh, in that meeting, uh, everyone was uh, presenting and so forth. But there was a little, little bit of rabble rousing and yay, yay, and cheering going on because people were standing up and saying, we need to do something about these university museums and I'm from one and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to do this and I want to do that. And so uh, I met a bunch of other people that were mm -hmm. like-minded. Uh, Stephen DeClerc was there. And so yes. he and Peter Stanberry were kind of um, the popular leaders, I would say, yep. of that group. Although there were a number of others and uh, it escapes me exactly who, but uh, uh, at the time, but that led to, um, of course, Bar Barcelona yep. uh, meeting. And I believe that was the first thing where things were really gelling. That's right. And so I was at Barcelona and I think all of the meetings for quite some time after that. Yeah. I know Australia. Australia meeting, in 2002, that's right. We were in 2003 here. Um, you know, I went to the meeting in uh, Austria and Korea and Portugal and uh, yep. Manchester, UK. And um, I couldn't go to some of the others later yeah. on. But anyway, I went to a number. Yeah. Do you think that, um, do you sort of get the impression looking back now? I mean, yeah, there was, there was a, a sort of a bit of a rabble rousing start to, uh, to, okay. uh, to you, Mac. And it did sort of build on the kinds of experiences that people were having at a national level uh, about difficulty to get support for university museums. So you could, you could understand why that was there. Do you think that, um, oh, this is a, a 
possibly a chance for you to reflect a bit. Do you think that we've actually come anywhere? We've actually sort of achieved much since those early days of uh, rabble rousing and demanding people pay attention to university museums. My answer is yes, although I would qualify it by saying that in the last few years, I've not kept up with everybody and everything uh, yeah. since retirement. And um, so there may be many things that others would say that say, well, this didn't get done or that didn't get done. But here's why I say it. Um, number one, um, it did change in the US. So uh, as I say, you know, the accreditation changed, the different view, people from university museums began to appear on the national board. Yep. Uh, and the building of natural history museums in particular took off. And um, not only were new ones built in uh, Texas, um, in Utah, um, in, um, there was a new one up uh, in Montana, um, mm -hmm. but, and a lot of them got refurbished and rebuilt yep. from the inside out. So there were not only some brand new ones and stuff. So money did come in, things happened here. <clears throat> now, as far as uh, UMAC itself, remember 20 years is 20 years. Um, and it may seem like a lifetime in some ways, but that's a long time for an upstart organization to come up <laughs> in my opinion, and be as successful as it has been. Yep. Look, um, there were questions when we first started about whether, you know, ICOM would accept us at all. And yeah. the word, I, you know, it was words that I were hearing when I was at those me early meetings was, oh, we'll have a terrible time. ICOM doesn't want any more committees. Yes. And there were questions coming from people like, why do, why do universities want those meetings? Why do, why do they want to be a committee? We don't need them. It's already covered by somebody else. Yes. Yep. Well, yeah, that idea that you know, disciplines is how it should be divided up. That, yeah. Well, I think that I think that a very good job was done convincing them because according to what I heard, it happened in a very short time yep. that we became a committee within a year or so uh, and a half or something. And um, that took a bit of convincing, although since that time, there have been a number of new committees that have come into ICOM. Um, but here's what university museums have to offer and I think that some of that, we did a good job of convincing ICOM in any way yes. that we should be. And that is, look, we have the bulk of the world's collections, whether you want to sit now, it may not be, be the most fanciest stuff necessary, necessarily, yeah. or the most glittery stuff. But the fact is that university museums document globally what we are all about hundreds of millions of specimens and items are in university collections. So the numbers are there. We're a tremendous resource, particularly in areas of biodiversity and cultural history. Yep. Archaeology, for instance. My own museum has 10 million objects, 10 million objects, and we're not counting every fish in every jar. Sure. I mean, yep. it's, counting, it's a lot, you know. Um, Secondly, we have tremendously well-trained people. Mm -hmm. We have PhD level research people. We have PhD level teachers. So we have a tremendous resource physically in the collections and a tremendous resource academically that yep. can all be shared. Another thing was that people didn't even think about for some reason or other that lots of museum people working, lots of staff and professions and directors working in museums were trained at universities. How did exactly. they get their degrees? <laughs> the universities had collections yep. and they had museums. And there was even museum studies programs which were starting to really take off. So we had resources, uh, people and things. We had programs where we were training 
the people that were in ICOM. Yeah. Running ICOM were trained by universities. Yeah. I think so, that's, a, that's a very important point because um, you're one of the few people I know who have actually written about what is required to actually run a university museum and how that is perhaps different from running a non-university museum. Um, this is fascinating yeah. to me at the time and still is really. Um, and there are many other things that university museums have to offer. I mean, they are and could very well, therefore where research is done also, it's not just that we have excellent people that teach, but they're doing a lot of research that private museums don't do. Yeah. You know, they show things, they do education, that's wonderful and so forth and so on. But when it gets down to the research on these things, this primarily is not being done by uh, many of the large museums. Now the Smithsonian in the US, of course, has res many researchers that mm -hmm. do this. But by and large, if you look at your city museum, they're not doing research. Uh, that's coming from the local or you yeah. know, universities that are doing archaeological things, biological things, even into art. All, I mean, we all know the whole thing, and you just look at TV anytime and all of these programs that Nova has or what used to be Connections had yep. um, and all these things. So there's a tremendous number of resources and reasons why university museums needed to be brought into the fold of ICON. Yep. And um, with the changes that were taking place, um, you know, not, and uh, again, one of the things that was important to me was strategic planning. I, we were one of the first, uh, if not the first, um, committee that actively started strategic planning. Yeah. And you and were, you headed up that too, I think, didn't you? Yes. In the, in the beginning. And then uh, it was only about two or three three years after that, that I caught, and caught wind of it and thought, uh, I think we better do some, <laughs> some strategic planning. <laughs> so, you know, um, and I was very naive about it, but I'll stop talking there because I know you might have other questions anyway. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's all. That's, that's fantastic stuff. And great to hear. Maybe just, we, we should say something about the terrific conference in 2003 that was actually held at your your museum now um i still remember that conference and in fact today especially for this interview i managed to find uh this particular oh my goodness uh, <laughs> and i remember that conference well because it's one of the only umac conferences i've been to that had its own line of merchandise <laughs> and I thought, I thought that was particularly entrepreneurial of you. Um, but that was that was a great conference. I'll just tell you um, tell you why I thought it was quite an eye opener. Firstly, it was just after the wonderful achievement of building the new museum there, and it was a new museum that not only served served the university, but it also served the region as as a big sort of you know provider of museum services. So to me, it was kind of emblematic of the way university museums needed to reach out from beyond their own sort of campus walls and engage directly with the community. And in fact, as I remember, that um, conference was called Engaging with the Community. What, what was your, your sort of thinking behind, um, you know, being mad enough to put your hand up and say, yep, we'll have a UMAC conference here in Oklahoma. Well, um, there were two things at work. Um, I'll explain my part of it first. <laughs> right, yeah. I knew, I knew that I wanted to be involved. I was very excited about UMAC. I wanted to see it succeed. Um, I had already held regional conferences. I'd been strongly involved in the national conferences. Um, I felt I knew what it took to succeed. Um, you know, and the, the number of people I thought was uh, about a good a size, you know, that you can work with. It wasn't thousands. And if you go to an yep. AAN yep. meeting, there's sometimes 8,000 people there. Yeah. But this meeting was a handleable size, you know, a couple of hundred. Um, and then I had Mike Maris, the director, breathing down my neck saying, we're going to do this. <laughs> you do it. 
Mike, Mike had already decided it was going to happen. Well, he told, he told me to do it. So, I, well, right. so but, uh, you know, I, I can't say that it was entirely a mutual decision, but I said, yeah, you know, I, I have already thought about it. And uh, I can't remember whether I came back and said, you know, it's a good idea. And he said, okay, do it. Or whether he came to me and said, no, you're going to do it or something. But <laughs> certainly uh, it was important that Mike was on board with that. As you know, he's been important and been at the meetings and has presented at the meetings yep. and, um, you know, fully supported uh, at, the, at the time, of course, uh, with, with me at the museum, supported those activities for me to do those sorts of things, realizing that, hey, we have something great here uh, that's not been done in a long time. Oh, that's going to sound terrible. I sound like I won't say that. <laughs> but, um, but it was a showpiece. He yep. wanted to show it, and um, we really wanted people to see, you know, that. And plus, um, there were so many people like yourself and others that we could learn from. I mean, we really needed uh, to know what other people were doing in other countries. Oh, I, think, I think we were learning from, from you guys because I, I think that, well, to me, visiting the, the museum and going to that conference, just to see what could be done with a natural history collection within a university context, yeah. that, that, was, it, that was mind-blowing stuff. It was really too bad in a way. And some of the buildings were there, and I can't remember whether we went to them, but some of the old buildings, if we had been able to show the contrast with, they had formerly yeah. been horse barns and um, gunnery sheds from the old uh, army training activities that the university had for its uh, officers training program and this kind of stuff. And they were, you know, in horrible shape yeah. to show the contrast. But, you know, um, I think, you know, unabashedly, uh, it was important to let the world know that and I'm, by the world, I mean our own university world. Yeah. And the U.S. know that in Oklahoma, this sort of thing had happened and that we could have a, a global meeting here, um, which uh, was important. We needed to show our own university and we needed to show, um, you know, a number of people in the U.S. that, in fact, these kinds of things are important. They're here. Yeah. And this university is here and we can do this. And, and so, I think, yeah, I think you did that pretty emphatically too. Uh, I mean, it was uh, change having gone back, although there were a number of things I thought were all really on spot on, but um, I remember that um, it was a bit, I, I felt like a taskmaster trying to get all these things done. And I was <laughs> actually a bit more open in some ways uh, because there were some things we kind of missed visiting um and i was trying to give everybody a smattering of you know what it was like climatically here and what the yep. mountains looked like and the the countryside and this yeah. that and the other thing there were a few things that uh, i wish we could have done um but no re not too many regrets there uh, yeah yeah no that's that's good to hear no i, I certainly remember that the one other thing that uh, that really characterized that conference for me and and set i thought a really high standard as to what umac conferences would be all about is that you you did go there you got a sense of the the university and the museum and the collections and what they were doing with them but you also got a sense of um the region the sense of you know what other networks you're engaged with the sense of you get you get to you know a really good sense of the culture and uh, and the kind of atmosphere of the place and and i think that because that happened in some of the early conferences like yes. like uh, australia and oklahoma yeah. um yeah. people have continued on with that tradition uh mostly and you always do uh well, I certainly get a feeling that when you go to a conference, you're getting more than the actual discussions in the conference. You're getting a whole yeah. sort of experience. I think that's very important. And we had just come off of the conference in Australia, of course, which I enjoyed tremendously. And I thought, you know, this is very well run. This is great. We took the trips, you know, uh, south 
um, we got out and saw a number of different museums. The papers were great. And, and here's another reason, there are other reasons why, you know, I think it points to one of the reasons why UMAC has succeeded, that we've not only held a long tradition of these excellent conferences, hmm. in my opinion, and then having great representation at the triennials with ICOM, we had yep. great participation of our conferences there because we held a mini conferences there. Yeah, that's right. And then coming out of that, the substance coming out of that was the publishing of the papers, which you've been heavily involved in and mm. I've been heavily involved in at times yep. as editors and so forth. And so, you know, um, I felt I was very proud. One of the things I was proud of was the uh, publication that we came out of at the 203 conference. But we had, uh, the standard had already been set previously in Barcelona yeah. and, and with you guys in Australia. So, um, and the continuation of that to these days of those publications coming out, I think has been very important. So yeah. when I think of UMAC, I, 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 I don't know very much about all of the rest of the committees in ICOM, but I have to believe that UMAC, uh, I do follow the Natural History Committee and some of the, yep. uh, the education, that UMAC has set a, a pretty high bar and has met the bar. Yep. I mean, it, it has survived, it has increased its membership, its communication, it's got a nice, much better webpage than we had when we started, of course. Everyone's got, got a much this. better web page. <laughs> Back the web had only ah, just been discovered, of course, in the early days. Yeah. And the papers and the conferences and so forth um, uh, are really top notch. I'm really proud of what we were able to get yeah. started and carried on. Yeah. No, that's that's terrific, Peter. And look, thank you very much for um, for, for talking today. It's uh, it's been a, a delight to. Um, spend a bit of time reminiscing about the the early days of, of UMAC. Um, it's been it's been great to, to catch up and, and reconnect with you after a, a few years. Now, I hope that you'll be able to come along to um, uh, another UMAC conference or two. I know it's, uh, yeah, I know with the state of the world at the moment, maybe no one will ever travel uh, internationally again, but, uh, but hopefully uh, things might might change for the for the better. Well, hello to anybody who's out there and listening that uh, I've met, and anybody I haven't met, I hope to see you uh, at a meeting. Yeah. I, I do have one question that I would ask. Sure. Um, you asked me what about perhaps the future of UMAC and what yeah. doesn't happen. And one thing occurred to me, and I admit that I have not gone in depth uh, in asking anyone about it, but I posed this question about what we call succession planning. Yep. And so, as you know, um, UMAC has been headed by very strong people over these years and yes. so on and so forth. And so when it comes time to hand the reins over again, and UMAC I think has done a good job of this, but I, I always want to know the plan, and I don't expect an answer here, of course, from yep. you or anything, but I would ask um, the board about the succession planning um, of the future of the board and the future of the leadership and so forth to make sure that yeah. things don't drop off. Because one of the dangers that happens not only with museums being built, there's this tremendous peak when they're built and the money comes in and the museum gets built and so forth. But sometimes thereafter, there's a crash after a couple of years. Yes. When the, everyone says, well, it's all over and blah, blah, blah. And they have trouble with sustainability. Yep. And we were one of the ones that tried to get around that, although everybody suffers a little bit. And sometimes that happens with committees like UMAC, even though, but, I think it's gone long enough so it's not going to happen and every committee or every group has its up and down. Yep. But succession planning is always something I ask about because I'm used to be the strategic planner and so <laughs> uh, it always comes to mind. Yeah. So uh, I that's think not that's not a downer note. It's just no. a question note. So. I think that's I think that's an interesting question too and I mean I've I've been involved with a couple of the more recent committees and I know that it's always an issue there that's in the background because there are of course set limits for 
anyone's tenure right. with uh, with you, Mac, as there are with with most of these kind of you know, organisations where you, you get engaged for for voluntary um, uh, on a voluntary basis anyway. Um, so look, I think I think that question's always always there, but I think you're also right in they're always we've been fortunate as a committee in as much as there's always been strong-willed and determined people uh, ready to step up and um, and take the reins and um, and even even tell uh, you know, even sort of do some of that strategic thinking that, that you were so close, been so closely involved with in laying out plans for you know what we want to achieve uh, in the you know in the next um, sort of you know, period of um, a board's existence and What's I think the next 20 years look like um, I, I don't know, Peter. <laughs> um, but I think I think it's interesting. I think you're right in as much as as UMAC probably has established itself. Um, I think if you if you have a look at the there is a strategic plan that the yeah. current board has got, of course. And you know we still know very little about university museums in some parts of the world. Um, you know, yeah. India, Africa. Um, we're starting to, to know more and more about China, which is good, but there are still some sort of blank pages in the folio, if you like. So there's, you know, I think there's still plenty more work for, for UMAC to do. Um, but we do, uh, we, we do definitely need a strategic planner such as yourself uh, in there to continually remind us <laughs> that you, you need to think ahead and think about... <laughs> It's like, it's never done. Yes. <laughs> it's never done. And that's it's just one of those things, you know, it's, it's a living or it should be a living, like a living organism. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very true indeed. Now, um, well, are, are you... it's been a pleasure, Andrew, and I don't want to tie up the airwaves forever on this. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been great to catch up, Peter. And for those watching, could I also just let you know that this is the first time that the UMAC Origins uh, discussion has been entirely dominated by old bald men with white beards. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Peter, I look forward to catching up again sometime. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay, all the best. Great to talk. Okay, bye-bye.